Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, this time round, I'm doing the long-awaited and uh, much um, teased uh, video about how to start your classic car engine. And I've put this off and put this off for the simple reason that it's almost impossible to cover every situation with every classic car. They vary so widely in uh, carburetor injection, choke or non-choke, fixed choke or variable jet carburetors. I mean, the list goes on, manual or automatic. It's almost impossible to know where to start. And that's just petrol engine classic cars, which the vast majority of them still are. So I'm going to do my best to try and break this down and explain it. So let's have a closer look. Well, if I tell you that over 70% of wear in a classic car engine occurs during start and warm up, uh, you realize how important it is to get this right. And um, a lot of cars didn't get this right at all, with a di direct result that the engine wore out more quickly. Uh, at the risk of uh, sounding very glib. That is the stark reality of the situation. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to explain uh, why engines wear so quickly when you start them up. So generally speaking, things have moved on so much these days, as we'll see a bit later with the, the Bentley I'm using as an example. When you start the engine, it's all electronically managed. The mixture isn't over rich. Engines, when they're cold, petrol engines need a much lower fuel to air ratio in order to make combustion happen. It's called a rich mixture, which has to happen for a petrol engine to start from cold. And manufacturers have got a lot better at that. And I mean a lot better. Uh, but in the old days, if you weren't careful, you could throw too much petrol in or whatever. So anyway, I'm going to explain the first principles of how the oil works its way around the engine. Well, the first few moments when a, a, a car engine is stirred from its slumber are absolutely crucial. Um, and the main reason is uh, oil circulation. Uh, this is a, a Lamborghini V12. Um, this is the oil pump that goes on the front of the engine there. So the oil gets sucked from a pickup pipe. This is obviously almost upside down. Um, the pickup pipe uh, sucks the oil through the pickup pipe. It comes in through there. A gear-driven oil pump pushes the oil through there, through the filter, um, round through this port here via a small U-shaped um, tube, not U-tube, into the block there, which then goes there, along the main oil gallery underneath, and then up into the cylinder heads, and then along the camshafts, etc. And this process is very critical because these shell bearings, for example, are, this is what the crankshaft actually runs in. These are, the, uh, these are big ends, actually, but the, the whole crankshaft runs on shell bearings, in this case, high specification, because this is a high performance engine with three metals, copper, lead, indium, but it doesn't matter. A shell bearing still does the same job. It just supports the engine, but the oil supply is critical here. You do not want these going dry and rubbing against the crankshaft journals, and they are incredibly soft. Uh, this lead is a very soft metal, um, and uh, so it doesn't take much to damage them. But that route I was describing all the way around here, okay, this is an exception because it's a V12. There's a lot of engine for the oil to get round, but all engines uh, to a greater or lesser degree have the same thing. So the oil feed, that incredibly tortuous route that the oil has to flow around any engine, more so this one, yes, but any engine is the critical part of starting an engine from cold because Essentially, the last time you've run the engine before you start it, the engine has probably been warm and all the oil has drained out of the, the, the crankshaft and the bearings here, leaving a small residue. When you start the engine from cold, and it does start almost immediately, assuming that you, everything, the ignition and fuel systems are working properly, all of a sudden this engine has gone to next to no oil in the crankshaft to spinning at 1500, 2000 RPM in the blink of an eye. And um, that means that this route I've described, the engine has to go all the way around that before the engine can even think of getting proper um, lubrication. And the, the funny thing is, <coughs> over the years, it was a bit of a mystery to me um, why the bearings nearest the oil pump should always wear more, generally speaking because it seems odd that the oil pump you'd have thought had the best source of oil. But what happens is in fluid dynamics, the fluid gets pumped along the engine, 
to its respective places, camshafts, etc., and then builds the pressure back up to the oil pump. It hits the wall and then bounces back from the wall. And I've seen this in lots of engines that, um, I mean, two or three years ago, I, I can't imagine you can get a much better built engine than an AMG hand-built V8 in a Mercedes. But we did have one here that had done 30,000 miles, full history, never been abused, and one of the big end bearings went on it. So this, is a, this can happen. No engine is above having this happen to it, really. Um, so we get, we get oil all around the engine, and you can tell normally by the beat of the starter motor um, how many turns the engine has done before it fires. And I think you'd be surprised at how few it actually is. Um, for instance, if, if you turn the key and it goes and then bursts into life, if it's a four-cylinder engine, um, you get four beats. Um, obviously, a four-cylinder engine, a four-stroke engine, as most classic car engines are, means it actually only fires or compresses every second revolution. So if you have four beats, it means the engine has revolved twice. As I say, I'm trying to compress a lot of information here into a very short space of time, but um, essentially, every beat is a cylinder compressing as the starter motor cranks the engine, and it can be one turn or two, which is barely enough time to get the oil around the engine before it suddenly, boom, it's into life. Um, so how do we get around this? How do we improve on it? Well, um, the essential thing is to not put the engine under too much speed or pressure before it fires. Um, so ideally, and this is something I'm going to go into and just give a couple of examples now. Um, you don't want to, um, the likes of a British car, an MGB GT, an Austin Healey 3000, with a manual choke, your traditional British car, you pull the choke out on the dashboard and you start the engine and the engine doesn't care. The engine is only interested in firing it's got, it's, got it's got ignition, it's got fuel, it's got compression, it's got the right, everything happening at the right time. You crank the engine over, put, and with the choke fully out, it will burst into life. Doesn't matter whether the oil's getting around it or not. So um, we're gonna have a look at uh, a car of James's here, actually. Um, and I'm just gonna explain, we're gonna start the engine on that, and I'll explain a little bit more about what I'm talking about with that type of engine. Well, here I am in one of the more um, unusual cars uh, in the workshop. This is James who works here. His dad made four of these, creative little person. And it's basically a 400 kilo trike with a Mini Cooper S engine in it, developing over 100 brake horsepower. So this thing is not slow. And uh, yeah, James comes from a very interesting family. His, one of his ex-girlfriends is Ettore Bugatti's granddaughter, but the... Um, the more, the more observant amongst you may notice this is not a Bugatti. But um, anyway, I'm going to start this. Uh, I'm going to pull the choke out on full, and then I'm going to crank it over and start it. And let's just listen to what happens. Right, so what happened there was... I think it was two or three beats of the starter motor, so it was probably one and a half turns of the engine, and then it bursts into life, and all of a sudden it's doing 2,000 RPM, um, and that exactly exemplifies why this car, this engine, will wear. So really, I would suggest, if you have a car like this, as I say, British cars with manual chokes, leave the choke in, probably better it varies again what type of clutch is fitted as to whether you, it helps pushing the clutch down or not. Some it does, some it doesn't. MGB GTs, Aston Martin DB4s have a carbon clutch release bearing pad on the clutch. If you push the clutch, that actually puts more pressure on the starter motor. If you actually leave it in neutral and leave the clutch off, it helps. Other cars, it helps pushing the clutch down. It's terribly complicated, this. I'm trying to generalise here, but uh, what you should really be doing is turning the engine over, turning, it's trying to fire now because it's been running, but turn the engine over on the starter motor for maybe four or five seconds, then pull the choke out, start the car as normal, and just push the choke in as quickly as is humanly possible to keep the car running. 
and your engine will thank you for it. So let's move on now to another car that we've got here, a Lamborghini Miura that we've got in the workshop. And I'm going to start that. That's a very different technique, but the rules still apply. <coughs> I hope you're not filming this, Jonathan. <sighs> Well, we move to a very different kind of engine now with, with effectively no choke, um, but these great big, 12 great big hungry carburettors uh, chokes wanting to throw lots of air and fuel into the engine, as is right and proper. But the danger with this one is, I mean, normally for this type of car, these are fixed jet carburettors, very different to the SUs used in uh, a lot of cars. The trick with fixed jet carburettors, switch the ignition on, uh, let the fuel pump prime the whole system. You can hear it slow down as the pressure builds up six pumps of the throttle um, and then immediately turn the key and just play the throttle till the engine bursts into life and that's all well and good um, and after that's happened assuming it does start if it doesn't then you repeat the process exactly six pumps of the throttle again once it's started you have to keep the engine running at between 1500 and 2000 rpm once the oil's got round so after five ten seconds of the engine going pff, pff, which it will do because there's no choke um, it's relying on simply um, get, getting as much fuel as it can when it starts to smooth out you don't let the engine idle outside your garage while you close the garage door and lock the house before you take your classic car for a run so you start the engine preferably with as few revs as possible for the first few seconds to let the oil get round then you warm it up, then you warm it up at about 1500 RPM, ideally. You do not let an engine like this or any classic car engine sit and go ba-dum, ba-dum, ba-dum. Because what's happening then is the oil, which is still cold, the components will be starved of oil because it's re revolving too slowly. So you have sort of another problem. It's all very, very difficult, this. So in essence, to keep it simple, crank the engine over, it must crank over for three or four seconds before it fires, ideally. Once it bursts into life, give it a couple of seconds, it'll sort itself out and spit and, and whatever anyway, uh, an engine like this. Once it starts to smooth out, keep it at 1500 RPM until it's getting warm, and then you can let it idle. But do not let the engine run too slow. It is such an art to this. And I'll say it one more time before the end of the video, but I'm now going to start this Miura. It's stone cold. Um, and I'm going to apply the thing of the, the technique of switching the, the uh, ignition on, six stabs of the throttle and slowly bringing it into life and then holding it at 1500 RPM ish to warm it all through. We'll do that now. Okay, it took two or three bites of the cherry, which can happen with these engines, because I say they effectively have no choke on them. But um, engine bursts into life, we've got a bit of cranking. When it does burst into life, we don't wing the throttle, as it's called. We don't vroom, vroom, vroom. That will wash the bores. It will kill the engine before it gets warmed up, before the synthetic esters in modern engines and the blends and the viscosity index indicators and things like that start kicking in. It can actually tear between extreme pressure parts like crankshaft bearings and camshaft lobes, so things like that. No histrionics with the engine when it's cold. Once the oil's got round for the first few seconds, 1500 to 2000 RPM or a fast idle, absolutely perfect. And believe me, your engine will thank you for it.
One example of uh, an engine sort of cranking over on the starter motor and then suddenly bursting into life and revving far too quickly before the oil's uh, got a chance to get round is this car. Fabulous car, but the technology at the time that Lamborghini could use wasn't there to micromanage the engine like it is in the 21st century. And you will hear the oil doesn't really get a chance to get around the engine once I crank this over and start it. It's fast idling very quickly. This is how they were set up, but it's not the best cold start scenario for an engine. Well, as you can hear, that engine is running at around about 2,000 RPM, which isn't a problem particularly, but it's quite quick from cold for an engine to be running at, particularly when it chimed in a maximum of two seconds after I turned the starter motor. The engine didn't really have time for the oil to circulate and pressurise all the way around. A little bit drastic, that, from cold. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next one. Well, I'm now going to give you an example of how it should be and how a lot of modern cars actually are. This is a Bentley Continental R wide body, quite a rare car from uh, 1999. Uh, and this has got the Zytec managed six and three quarter litre V8 in it. And that is the crucial thing. It's got a proper engine management system. Um, so what it does is it allows it to crank over for a few seconds deliberately they do not allow the engine to start. And this is something very important. Modern car manufacturers, if, if they wanted, a petrol engine could start just like that. They deliberately build in, uh, letting the engine crank over just a few times, as I was talking about earlier, a few beats of the engine, one, two, three, four, five, something like that. That one or two crankshaft revolutions makes the world a difference in the oil pump, giving the engine and the oil pump a chance to start to prime the engine with oil. And this is a, a lovely example of starting for a few revolutions and then bursting into life at a lovely fast idle with um, a, a mixture that is not too rich. With manual choke cars, you really want to be getting the choke in as soon as is humanly possible. And with cars with automatic chokes, older versions of these with an automatic choke like the shadows and the clouds and things, they do suffer with the same problem. You start the engine and then it, boom, it's bursting into life at 2000 RPM instantaneously. My advice with that would be, if you own um, a car like that, again, crank the engine for a few seconds just to give the oil a chance to get round. Then put your foot on the floor to um, prime the automatic choke and then start the engine. So um, I'm going to start this Bentley now and we can hear the difference in the way it all performs. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and plenty of comments. And please be gentle with me because I just cannot incorporate everything into a video like this. But um, anyway, we'll be back with something else very soon. And I hope you've enjoyed it.